Uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, QSCO on Air uh, conference. And uh, I'm glad to introduce you, uh, Dr. Bartolo Albanese, uh, which was a, uh, which is a former PhD uh, of my group, which uh, we talk uh, about uh, radiative cooling uh, of a spin ensemble. Uh, please, Bartolo, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for having invited me to talk uh, here. Uh, so I um, I will. Um, talk about my PhD uh, work that I performed in um, the Quantronics group under the supervision of uh, Patrice Bertin. And whose title is indeed uh, Radiative Cooling uh, of a Spin Ensemble. The um, research uh, project behind this work is the, based on the idea of using superconducting circuits uh, to uh, do magnetic resonance experiments. And the uh, original motivation for, um, for this research is the idea that we can increase the uh, sensitivity of a um, standard uh, spectrometer like the one here uh, in picture by uh, replacing this setup on a new setup based on such a, a superconducting resonator that can have a micrometric or even nanometric inductor. And this allows us to um, uh, detects even a few uh, spins in a single experiment. Now, what I will present to you today is um, a new uh, research line uh, where uh, the idea is to use the uh, superconducting uh, resonator coupled to spins to realize this uh, radiative cooling of an electron spin ensemble. Now, in the following, we'll, uh, we'll consider a, a very dilute electron spin um, ensemble, meaning that the um, interaction between spins are negligible, so that the uh, temperature of the spin ensemble is then set by the interaction of the ensemble with two different baths, the uh, phonons in the crystal hosting the spins, and on the other side, the uh, photons in the electromagnetic environment. Now, um, the temperature of the spin is then uh, given by the relative strength, here represented by these arrows, with which the spins interact with the two baths. And this strength is uh, given by the uh, spontaneous emission rate uh, gamma for a single spin into uh, each bath. Now, the fact is that for an electron spin, the um, spontaneous photon emission time is of about 10,000 years. So you can imagine then that in our most situations, the uh, phonon spontaneous emission rate is orders of magnitude larger than the photon one. And as a result, the temperature of the spin ensemble is always set by the phonons in the crystal independently of what happened in the electromagnetic environment. And then uh, here we pose ourselves a very simple question. That is, can we somehow reverse this scenario and have the spins thermalize to um, an electromagnetic environment even colder than the uh, phonon lattice. Now, uh, to do so, we would need to then uh, accelerate the uh, photon spontaneous emission rate of several orders of magnitude. Now, uh, the question if we uh, can we uh, do this or not? Well, it's um, already of um, interest from a fundamental physics Point, point of view. But uh, our main motivation is the fact that this can be of interest for a magnetic resonance experiment. Now, the reason why uh, so, um, well, let's consider a standard magnetic resonance experiment. So we have our sample of the spins, that is an, a temperature uh, typhon, in, inserted in a resonant cavity of frequency omega zero. Then we apply a static magnetic field, B0, that splits the uh, parallel and anti-parallel spin states, so that at a certain point, the uh, spin transition frequency, omega s, is resonant with the uh, cavity frequency, omega 0. At this point, we can excite the spins with some electromagnetic drive. And as a result, the spins will start a collective precession motion about B0 that generates an electromagnetic wave that is our magnetic resonance signal. The amplitude of this signal is proportional 
to the um, initial spin population unbalance that time. That is basically the difference between the number of spins that are initially in the ground states minus the number of spins in the excited states. And this is nothing else in the end than the uh, polarization of the initial polarization of the ensemble. Now, at thermal equilibrium, the polarization is simply given by the Boltzmann distribution in the two um, levels. And this results in this hyperbolic tangent law for the temperature dependence of the polarization. The fact is that um, for typical experimental conditions, uh, that is temperature and field, this polarization can be much lower than one. As a result, uh, here it comes the uh, interest in going beyond the uh, thermal equilibrium polarization to try to reach uh, full polarization, so increase the electromagnetic signal. This is what we call hyperpolarization of a spin ensemble. Now, for electron spins, the uh, technique available nowadays are based basically on optical pumping. And a typical example are uh, NV centers in diamond, that may be familiar to, to some of you. And, but the general idea is always the same, and this to use some spin-dependent optical transition to uh, initialize the spin state into its ground state. Um, to do so, we just have to illuminate the sample with a proper laser light. Now, this can be a very powerful technique for NV centers. For example, we can reach almost 100% polarization at room temperature for a gigahertz transition. So very powerful, but it's far from being a universal technique because as you may see, we need some special um, electronic structure. So it applies to a subset of spin ensembles. On the other hand, for nuclear spins, we have the uh, set of techniques under the name of dynamical nuclear polarization. Here, the idea is that uh, the nuclei, due to their uh, much smaller gyromagnetic ratio with respect to electrons, they uh, have a much uh, smaller uh, resonant frequency with respect to electrons. And this means that for the same um, experimental condition, the nuclear polarization is much lower than the electron one. Then the idea is to transfer with some uh, microwave drive the uh, elect large electron spin polarization toward the nuclei, um, thus reaching large uh, nuclear polarization. Now, this um, nuclear hyperpolarization technique is very efficient and also very broadly and general used. Uh, however, here the, uh, you may uh, see that the ultimate physical limit is again the initial electron spin um, thermal equilibrium polarization. So uh, for this to uh, reason, basically, uh, we find a motivation for look, uh, to look for a new universal hyperpolarization technique for electron spins. This is what I'm going to uh, present you today. So uh, as I told you at the beginning, uh, to uh, radiative cooled spins, basically we need to accelerate the uh, photon spontaneous emission rate. And um, a way to do, uh, to do so was already um, proposed by, uh, by Purcell, one of the fathers of uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, already at the early age of uh, this uh, set of uh, techniques, so in 1946. And the idea of um, Purcell is to insert the sample in a resonant cavity that must have two main characteristics, that is a small mod volume and a low energy loss rate. So as a result, the uh, new photon spontaneous emission rate is now um, given by this simple formula. That is, uh, we see that it's inversely proportional to the cavity loss rate, kappa. So we need a good cavity, a high Q uh, cavity and increases with G, that is the spin photon coupling. That uh, coupling term is basically given by the product of the spin magnetic dipole, so something we just had from uh, nature, and on the other side, the uh, magnetic field vacuum fluctuation at the spin location. So this means the uh, fluctuation for the cavity mode in the ground state. And this is uh, increased by reducing the volume of the cavity. So uh, we need such a small and high Q cavity, for this we can use superconducting resonators. Now, to give you some um, quantitative um, idea, 
uh, well, this is a picture of a standard um, magnetic resonance spectrometer, and for its uh, volume and cavity loss rates, basically the uh, photon spontaneous emission time is enormous compared to any other experimental time. So photon spontaneous emission in usual condition plays absolutely no role. On the other hand, if we go from a new setup based on such a superconducting resonator with a two micrometer inductance, for example, well, we can reduce the volume of the cavity to uh, the picoliter uh, scale while keeping a low loss rate. As a result, with this number, we get a, a photon spontaneous emission time for the spin of about 10 seconds. So now this uh, becomes uh, relevant. And now, uh, such, uh, using such a resonator, it was demonstrated in 2016, that we can reach this uh, parcel regime where the photon spontaneous emission rate for the spins is the faster relaxation mechanism. Um, and this uh, was um, obtained for an electron spin ensemble at 20 millikelvin, meaning that the cavity is in its uh, ground state and everything is uh, at a thermal equilibrium. So the sample is uh, at the 20 millikelvin temperature. So uh, this is the main most summarizing result where um, we have the total spin relaxation time that is basically the inverse of the total relaxation rate, the sum of the radiative and non-radiative one. It's a function of the, the tuning between the spin and the cavity. And what we see here is that when the two uh, systems are at resonance, the uh, total spin relaxation time decreases by several orders of magnitude, proving that the cavity announced uh, photon uh, relaxation, uh, photon emission by the spins becomes the dominant process. So in this uh, regime, the spin temperature is expected to be the same as the photon. But in this experiment, this was not yet demonstrated because everything was at thermal equilibrium at the mixing chamber plates of a cryostat. But uh, this is what we want to prove now. So the experiment I, I'm going to show you is uh, basically sch um, schematized here. So uh, what we want to do is to put the um, sample host in the spins and the cavity at 850 millikelvin inside the cryostat. And we know that uh, we want to have the spins in the parcel regime so that the spin temperature is set by the uh, photon temperature inside the cavity. Then we need to control the photon temperature. Now, the uh, cavity mode uh, is exchanging energy with two baths. The uh, internal losses that here I represent with a hot mirror of the cavity uh, with which it's uh, exchanging energy at rate kappa int, and uh, the external world with which the cavity is exchanging energy at rate kappa x. Now, if kappa x is much larger than kappa int, then the uh, temperature of the photons is set by whatever we uh, connect to the input. So what we do is we connect it to uh, via switch either to a hot thermal radiation source that is a resistor of the same sample temperature, or a cold one at 15 millikelvin. Now, when it is connected to the hot source, everything is at thermal equilibrium, photons, spin, and phonons are at 850 millikelvin. And as a result, our spins that have a resonant frequency of about 7.4 gigahertz have a polarization significantly lower than 1.2. Now, what happens when we connect to the cold load is just that the photons, thanks to the large capex, thermalized to 15 millikelvin, and in turn, the spins that are in the parcel regime thermalize to the same cold temperature of 15 millikelvin while their host lattice stay hot at 850. So as a consequence of this, we would expect the spin polarization to reach basically 100%, giving us an increase of polarization, so an increase of magnetic resonance signal of about a factor 4.5. So this is what we're going to do, uh, but to do so, uh, what we need to have is a spin ensemble with a sufficiently small uh, phonon uh, spontaneous emission rate. So a natural candidate for, for this experiment are uh, donors in silicon. These are elements of the fifth group in the periodic table that as a substitutional impurity in the crystal lattice of silicon, 
act as a donor. This means that the um, extra fifth electron with respect to the silicon lattice is promoted to the conduction band. Now, when we cool the system to cryogenic temperature, what happens is that this extra electron can be trapped by the Coulomb um, potential of the donor ion. And uh, this forms this uh, hydrogen-like uh, system that is our spin system. This uh, was already studied in, uh, in the 50s, again in the early age of magnetic resonance, as a, a model system for electron spin resonance. And uh, it was already in that period that it was clear that the spin phonon relaxation rate is uh, um, very uh, small compared to other systems. So here is a, an experiment performed in 1959 from uh, Ferran Gear that for phosphorus in uh, silicon uh, shows that the relaxation time uh, is of the order of several thousands of seconds for um, spin phonon relaxation. So this is um, enormous compared to the few seconds uh, photons time that we expect in our Purcell regime. Okay, so we chose for our experiment bismuth. Bismuth has also a phonon relaxation time of about 10,000 seconds at 1 Kelvin, so it's good for our experiment. And in addition to this, it has a, um, a spin transition frequency of about 7.4 GHz at zero magnetic field. This is a very useful uh, property uh, for us because this means that we can couple such a spin to a superconducting resonator, even apply a very small magnetic field that therefore doesn't um, perturb the superconducting properties of the resonator. And uh, this property is basically a consequence of the fact that we don't, not only have the uh, electron spin, but also a large nuclear spin that is interacting with our electron. Uh, and this is the Hamiltonian. So what we, uh, we see is that we have a large hyperfine coupling between the two spins, about 1.4 gigahertz. And as a consequence of this, uh, we have a much more uh, complicated uh, electronic structure with respect to a simple spin one out. So we have uh, 20 levels labeled in two uh, manifolds by the good quantum number that is the sum of the two um, angular moments. And uh, at low field where we work, in addition to uh, the standard electron spin transition where only the electron spin is flipped, we also have normally forbidden transition this diagonal uh, arrows here. And interestingly, uh, what we have is that um, these are quasi-degenerate in couples here marked by these red uh, black dots. But okay, this is a complicated system, but in the end, what we do is we isolate a single couple of quasi-degenerate transitions that at 60 millitesla, the field at which we operate, have a frequency of about 7.4 gigahertz. And this can be very well approximated by a sim simple spin one out system. The main difference is that now the uh, population and balance to which our signal is proportional is just given by the sum of the population in the two ground state minus the population in the two excited states. But for the rest, it's very similar to a spin one out. So we can almost forget about these complications. But it will have some consequences, as we will see. But okay. This is um, our energy structure, but uh, this is the corresponding spectrum. So the black lines are these uh, degenerate um, transitions and as a function of the magnetic field. And in blue, we have the frequency of our superconducting resonator. What we see is that at about 60 millitesla, um, this, our resonator is resonant with this couple of quasi-degenerate transition. And this is where we will work. So now we... Uh, just have a look to a closer look to this superconducting resonator. So it is a 50 nanometer thick niobium LC resonator that is patterned on top of a natural silicon chip. The, uh, you see the uh, capacitance is made with these interdigitated uh, fingers in parallel with this inductance that is uh, just a wire. Now, the spins are uh, bismuth donors, as I said, implanted just below the surface for one micrometer uh, depth. And the peak concentration is uh, of 3 10, 10 to the 16 per centimeter cube. That is quite low, so they are dilute. The uh, spins that we will uh, measure and uh, finally relatively cool, 
they are the closer to the inductor wire. So the spins are um, polarized by the static magnetic field P0 parallel to the wire and are coupled to the uh, resonator mode by its transverse magnetic field B1 generated by the current in the wire. And the strength of this coupling, the spin photon coupling, as I told you before, is proportional to the vacuum fluctuation of this transverse field. Now, uh, what is good here is that just from the geometry of our resonator, we can uh, calculate from electromagnetic simulation the exact value of uh, the vacuum fluctuation of this field. So we can estimate the spin photon coupling G for all the spins in our system. So this is the result of the simulation. So the uh, value of this uh, magnetic field fluctuations around the cross section of the inductor wire. The wire is this black uh, line here, while this square profile is the uh, due to the etching of the silicon surface due to the fabrication process. But okay, this is the cross-section. And we see that we have vacuum fluctuation of the order of 10 nanotesla. And from this, we get the map, the 2D map of the uh, spin photon coupling G. This calculated for one of the two degenerate, quasi-degenerate transitions. And we see we have a coupling of a few tens of hertz. Well, from this 2D uh, map, we obtain the most important uh, information that is we can have the distribution of the spin photon coupling G for our uh, spin. And from this we get that the uh, average defective um, uh, average coupling uh, G is of the order of 60 Hz for our spins because the, uh, we have many spins with um, low coupling but these are too weakly coupled so they won't contribute and this is the effective average value. Okay, so uh, we will use this uh, to basically uh, simulate the evolution of our spins. We have all the parameters to uh, calculate uh, the spin evolution without any adjustable parameters. So we can simulate our experiment and compare with the data. I will show you later some, uh, some results. So now we can go to the experimental parts finally. So this is the uh, picture of our superconducting resonator on its uh, silicon chip that it's insert in, uh, in this copper sample holder that then is, of course, closed. And uh, it, the antenna that uh, is in this sample holder allows to couple the superconducting resonator mode uh, to the external ward, so to the rest of the microcircuits. Then we put this cavity in uh, the superconducting coil and the coil is mounted inside the cryostat here at the mixing chamber plate, so 20 millikelvin, but then for the radiative cooling experiment, we move it to the steel plate, so the one Kelvin, more or less, the plate of the fridge. Okay, so the first thing that we uh, measure is the uh, superconducting resonator, in particular, its loss rate, because as I told you before, to do this radiative cooling, we need to have the external losses of the resonator to be much larger than the internal one to uh, set the spin, the photon temperature with the thermal radiation of the resistor. So to extract this, we just measure the reflection at the input of the cavity. This is the uh, phase on top of the reflected signal, um, but on the bottom, the amplitude of the signal as a function of frequency, so around the resonance. And from the fit of this data, we can extract the two uh, parameters. And we see, indeed, that we reach this overcoupled regime where the kappa x is much larger than kappa int. And moreover, from this value, we can also estimate our uh, parcel uh, spontaneous photon emission uh, time. So from the simple formula, uh, so from the 60 Hertz average spin photon coupling that I just shown you before, and from this uh, energy loss rate, we obtain uh, an estimated um, photon emission time of uh, about five to 10 seconds. So it's uh, what we want, okay. Then uh, this is how we measure the spin. So how we um, measure the temperature and the signal is by using the Hanico technique. So uh, it basically consists in sending a first short microwave pulse that rotates the spins by 90, de 90 degrees, so excites the spins to the equatorial plane. Due to the dishomogeneity of the ensemble, they start to uh, deface. But then what we do is, after a time tow, 
we invert the time evolution of the spin ensemble by applying this pi pulse that as a result give us at a, after a second time to, uh, to have all the spins again in phase. So at this moment, the spins, they emit their electromagnetic wave, that is our magnetic resonance signal, that here we call the echo. This echo signal is amplified and then demodulated and detected at room temperature. Uh, this is an example of measured echo in our experiment. The uh, area of this echo is our magnetic resonance signal that is proportional, as I said at the beginning, uh, to the uh, temperature dependent polarization. So this, if you want, is our thermometer. Okay, now we, uh, the first thing that we measure with this echo is the spectrum that I show you here. Uh, basically, we measure the echo as a function of the magnetic field and we see that every time the uh, resonator frequency um, is resonant with one of the um, spin transition, we see a peak in the echo amplitude. And as anticipated, we work at about 60 millitesla so of this transition here. Then um, we, uh, the first question we want to answer for our experiment is whether our spins are in the parcel regime in the world temperature range of our experiment. This is because what happens at finite temperature is that we have some thermal photons N inside the cavity. And what, uh, the consequence of this on the um, photon uh, spontaneous emission is that in addition to spontaneous emission, we have other two processes, absorption and stimulated emission. As a result, the uh, spin relaxation rate, gamma 1, uh, uh, is accelerated by this factor 2n plus 1. And what is interesting is that also the equilibrium um, polarization can be also expressed as a function of this average number of thermal photons. So, and we see that the, the two quantities basically have the same temperature dependence with respect to, to n. And this is the first very simple prediction that we want to test to show that our spins are in the parcel regime and we can perform the radiative cooling. So to, do, um, to verify this, we use uh, this first thermal equilibrium setup, meaning that we mount the sample here, um, the LC resonator and the spins, together with the uh, thermal source, the resistor, all at the same temperature T, the mixing chamber plate, and uh, we are able to vary then this temperature between 20 millikelvin and 1 kelvin. So here, spin, phonon, and photons are the same temperature. So this is the uh, electrical equivalent circuit of the experiment where uh, we see basically that our LC resonator is connected via a, an antenna, a capacitive and coupled antenna and a circulator to the resistor. And so in this way, the signal emitted by the spins is routed out to, uh, via the circulator to the output line. Okay, so what we uh, first measure is the uh, relaxation time. Uh, to do this measurement, we use the um, standard inversion recovery sequence, where with our first pi pulse, we excite the spins, and then after a varying time delta t, we measure the spin polarization with the echo. Here I show you the uh, echo measured for a very short delta t, so uh, short compared to the relaxation time, and for a very long one, uh, so when spins are thermal equilibrium. And what we see is that for a short delta t, the effect of the pi pulse is basically to invert the spin population as we want. So the shape of the, of the echo is the first example of application of our ability to um, simulate the spin evolution in the experiment without any adjustable parameters. And the, this black line are the result. So just using this, um, basically, mostly the um, spin photon coupling distribution G that I've shown you before. Now we repeat this uh, experiment as a function of delta t and we obtain the um, relaxation of the spins toward equilibrium. This is the echo amplitude as a function of delta t and this is the exponential relaxation that we fit with an exponential curve and from this we get a uh, relaxation time of about 6 seconds and this is, we already see, that it's uh, compatible with what we expect from the uh, spontaneous photon uh, emission rate we have calculated. So we can already say we seems to be in the parcel regime. But to have a, a more strong confirmation, we have simulated this experiment 
um, without adjustable parameters, with our simulation that accounts only as the only um, possible relaxation mechanism for our spins to be the uh, per cell uh, spontaneous photon emission. So this confirms that at 20 millikelvin we are in the per cell regime. Now, uh, then we just repeat this measurement as a function of temperature. Here we have the spin relaxation time function of temperature, and we see that it follows very well our 2n plus 1 law, that uh, means that our spins are indeed in the parcel regime from 20 millikelvin up to at least uh, 1.2 kelvin. So we can perform our radiative cooling experiment. Okay, we also measured the uh, polarization temperature dependence. Uh, here the data with a solid uh, green curve that is the analytical solution. We see that it almost coincides with the 2n plus 1 low. It only uh, differs from it at the lower temperature because, as I told you before, uh, we are not measuring a simple spin one half but a 20 level system and this deviation is due to the complication of the real uh, system but they are very uh, similar and at high temperature they coincide. Okay so now we can go to the radiative cooling experiment. Um, this is the electrical equivalent circuit of our experiment so we have the sample at 850 millikelvin and uh, via switch is connected to the cold or hot thermal source. And again, uh, thanks to the circulator, the signal emitted by the spins is routed to the output line, and here it is amplified by a traveling wave parametric amplifier at 15 millikelvin. So what we want to do is to see if our spins are um, hyperpolarized when connecting to the cold load. So this is the uh, echo amplitude measured in the hot case with the Han echo sequence. When we repeat the exact same measurement, but in the cold configuration, we see an increase of the echo signal, so of our magnetic resonance signal, by a factor 2.3. So we can say that our spins are uh, hyperpolarized. But now to uh, confirm that this increase of polarization is due to the radiative cooling, what we do is we measure the um, radiative uh, the relaxation to see if it coincides with our radiative relaxation model. So um, we uh, measure again the relaxation with the inversion recovery sequence. So here we have the echo amplitude as a function of the delay delta t in the hot case. From the exponential fit we obtain a relaxation time of 1.7 seconds and then what we do we repeat the exact same measurement in the cold case. And what we see is that the uh, amplitude of the signal first increases, as I said before, by a factor 2.3, okay? But most importantly, we see that also the uh, relaxation time increases by the same factor, reaching 4 seconds. So this confirms that uh, spins are relaxing in a radiative way and that uh, we are radiatively cooling the spin ensemble. Now, if we compare this uh, cooling factor with our 2n plus 1 low, we can say that we are cooling the spins from this 850 millikelvin to a temperature of about 350 millikelvin. Now, we're not reaching um, the 20 millikelvin, but uh, we understood this um, by um, looking for uh, microwave losses in the circuit, and we have found that in between the cold thermal source and the uh, cavity, we have about 2 dB uh, micro uh, losses. This means that even in the cold case, the cavity is coupled to some hot uh, microwave source, uh, to some thermal radiation, and this limits our efficiency. Okay, so uh, with this, I, um, I want to conclude. I hope I convince you that we have um, demonstrated a new uh, universal hyperpolarization technique, or at least uh, we have gave the proof of principle of um, this new technique based on a new uh, physical principle. Uh, but now you may uh, argue that uh, the, uh, we see clearly a limitation of this um, technique uh, if we consider real-world application, because uh, the, this technique is basically limited by the uh, physical temperature of the cold resistor. So you may wonder why not to put directly the sample at the minimum temperature the lower temperature of the cryostat. Now, a first answer is that in some cases it is useful to have the sample at a higher temperature in the cryostat 
uh, because higher temperature means also larger cooling power. And this can be, for example, useful in microwave to optical transaction experiments where we have, uh, we have to um, cool the, uh, the latter heating effect. But uh, we now may uh, pose a very uh, simple question, that is, can we, in principle, cool the spins below t cold? So can we cool the spins below the minimum temperature in the cryostat? And uh, the answer is yes, and for this we have um, a, a proposal for a new uh, experiment. So uh, the idea of this um, technique to cool the spins uh, below this uh, T-call is the following. So um, the main idea is to use um, nonlinear optical processes in our uh, microwave superconducting circuits. So uh, here it's the scheme of the um, experiment we want to do. So uh, we have the spins in the parcel regime coupled to a low frequency resonator of frequency omega one. This resonator it's uh, in turn coupled with some nonlinear uh, coupling to a high frequency resonator, frequency omega 2, that is well thermalized at the uh, sample temperature T4. Then, in this condition, at thermal equilibrium, what we have is that the thermal population in the low frequency resonator is much larger than the one in the high frequency resonator that could be even in its ground state. Now, uh, to cool uh, the spins, what we can do is to uh, modulate this um, coupling with uh, a proper frequency. And uh, then basically we uh, can activate some um, parametric up conversion process. And as a result, we can have the uh, two uh, population in the two resonators to be um, at equilibrium uh, and to have so also the low frequency resonator in its ground state. So to have it basically cooled by this uh, pumping. As a result, the spins that are coupled to the low frequency resonator are in turn cooled below the sample temperature without the need of uh, a cold um, resistor. So uh, we can, with this um, scheme in principle, cool the spins at an arbitrary low temperature below the um, minimum temperature of the cryostat. With this, I, I thank you for, uh, for your attention, and uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Bartolo. And uh, is there any question uh, in the audience? So I, I start with the question, uh, and uh, is this, so what's the limit of the difference T hot and T cold? That, uh, that you can, uh, in principle, uh, use in this experiment? Mm -hmm. I mean, can you cool down spins at uh, any high temperature, or uh, there are some...? Uh, so, uh, um, basically, the, um, we can think of many limitations. So here, uh, we put our sample at 1 Kelvin, uh, but uh, can we, for example, put it at 4 Kelvin? So, um, here, the, the first problem we we meet is, um, does the superconducting resonator stands higher temperature? So uh, at 4 Kelvin, already the niobium resonator could um, lose some, uh, have some uh, less good uh, property, so lose uh, its good uh, quality factor. Uh, but we can think of changing uh, to another superconductor um, more resilient to high temperature, so, for example, NBTIN, for example. Uh, so we can imagine to go to uh, for Kelvin or even higher temperature, but then at a certain point, it comes the other limitation, that is the um, phonon relaxation rate. So uh, for our uh, spin system, uh, we expect around, uh, indeed around for Kelvin already, the phonon relaxation rate uh, can uh, reach a value comparable to the uh, parcel photon relaxation time. So this uh, would uh, limit the, um, the efficiency of the cooling. So uh, given the, the system, uh, I would say we cannot go so much higher than, uh, than for Kelvin. We could uh, envision to go, um, with, but we would need some uh, more study to go up to uh, nitrogen temperature, for example. But for that, we would need a high TC superconductor 
and uh, we will need to have a good superconducting uh, resonator that works at that temperature and have a spin system that uh, even at that temperature has a sufficiently low gamma form. That's it's um, in principle possible, that, but it's more challenging. Okay, thank you. So if there is no any question, uh, we can thank Bartolo and uh, have a good afternoon.